So I'll go through and introduce each of our panelists briefly, and then we'll jump right in. So to my left is Ed Berger. Ed Berger is an associate professor recently promoted to full. Hey, hey. In engineering education and mechanical engineering at Purdue. He earned his PhD in mechanical engineering at Purdue in 1996, and his MS in mechanical engineering a little before that. Prior to joining us in 2014, he served as Associate Dean for Undergraduate Programs in the School of Engineering at the University of Virginia, where he was also a faculty member in Mechanical Engineering. Prior to joining UVA, he was on the faculty in Mechanical at the University of Cincinnati. His engineering education research agenda includes two key issues. First, as an instructor, the use of social media for effective teaching, and second, as an administrator, the emerging institutional research area of predictive models for student academic success. His mechanical engineering research interests include nonlinear mechanics of joints and interfaces. To Ed's left is Sherry Shepard. Uh -oh, here we go. It's over here. Sherry Shepard <laughs> is the Richard Whelan Professor of Mechanical Engineering at Stanford, where she teaches both undergraduate and graduate design classes and conducts research on fracture mechanics and applied finite element analysis. And she does research on how people become engineers. From 1999 to 2008, she served as a senior scholar at the Carnegie Foundation for the Advancement of Teaching, where she led the foundation's engineering study. In addition to publishing technical papers, reports, and textbooks, she has led or co-led several large multi-institutional projects to build new educational research programs and related resources, such as the Center for the Advancement of Engineering Education, the National Center for Engineering Pathways to Innovation, which some of you may know as the Epicenter, and a program on summer research experiences for high school teachers. Her industry experience includes engineering positions at all of Detroit's big three, Ford, GM, and Chrysler. Her work has been recognized with numerous honors and awards, including the Walter Gores Award, which is Stanford's highest award for excellence in teaching, and the Chester Carlson Award and Ralph Coates Rowe Awards from the American Society for Engineering Education, recognizing her distinguished accomplishments in engineering education and her outstanding teachable and notable contributions to the mechanical engineering profession. So to Sherry's left is Joyce Main. Assistant Professor of Engineering Education, recently given tenure and promoted to associate. And her research examines the impact of educational programs and policies on students' academic and employment pathways with a focus on participation of women and underrepresented minorities in engineering. In 2017, Dr. Main was awarded an NSF career grant to model longitudinal career pathways of engineering doctorates. She's also the PI of an NSF research study examining academic and employment returns to student engagement in cooperative education programs. Dr. Main is the recipient of the 2014 ASCE Educational Research Methods Apprentice Faculty Award, the 2015 Frontiers in Education Faculty Fellow Award, and the 2018 Violet Haas Memorial Fellowship, and very recently, the 2019 Betty Vetter Award for Research from WePan. And to Joyce's left is Tim Lazader. Tim serves as Purdue's Executive Director for Career Success and Director of the Center for Career Opportunities. Following a brief tenure working in the private sector, Tim began his career in University Career Services in 1981 at WVU. His career services work included career counseling and administrative positions at University of Illinois, Urbana-Champaign, and Indiana University, no hissing. Prior to his Purdue appointment in 2000, Tim served as the Career Center Director at Stony Brook University on Long Island. Having authored chapters in five books on career and job search related topics, Tim was awarded a Fulbright in 2005 to study higher education and society in Germany and Poland. Today, Tim leads career, Purdue's Career Readiness Assessment Team, an initiative of the University Innovation Alliance. So welcome all of our panelists. This is a lot of expertise here on the career pathways of engineers. So I'm gonna ask each panelist first to just provide a couple of sentences on what each one does to understand or improve the transition between engineering undergrad education and early career. Um, no, well, I, I was just gonna go, so let's just go. Uh, well, the, the focus of our attention in uh, we have a, a research grant called the Red Grant, Revolutionizing Engineering Departments in 
Um, our focus has been on the kinds of non-technical uh, preparation that students receive while they're here and how that aligns or doesn't align with what is useful for them in their first position after they graduate, uh, where these skills could include anything from communication to teamwork, um, any of the other um, uh, what people call professional skills. Um, and we're trying to understand a little bit more about um, the degree to which students feel they possess these skills and the degree to which they have access to opportunities to build those skills while they're here, um, and how we can just generally bolster their uh, readiness um, while they're here uh, and give them those experiences through uh, either curricular means or co-curricular slash extracurricular means as well. So we study that and we try to sort of figure out how we can advance our mission on, in that regard. Um, I think two things I'll mention uh, where we're puzzling through this question of, of students transitioning to early career professional. One has been a partnership which actually has been with Purdue and Rose Holman, San Jose State, Stanford, um, and uh, Virginia Tech and Virginia Commonwealth to really look at what is the relationship between career development centers and uh, local advising that students get within departments or student services office and you know the various points of view on that on on who is there to support students and how well does that work and ultimately we want that work to translate into materials and strategies for the various stakeholders um, who really are there to support questions around career development. Um, the other thing we do is we talk to a lot of early career engineers um, in terms of understanding the skills um, that are critical not only to their getting their work done and enjoying their work, but also for them to be thinking long term about their career. And, um, and really that's a great source of thinking about how does that translate back into, again, conversations that could or should be happening um, when students are still students. Good morning. Um, overall, my research group looks at student pathways into engineering and into the workforce. So we look at their pathways from high school to college and into the full workforce. So specific to their early career transitions, we're looking at how participation in cooperative education programs and co-ops and how that influences students' um, likelihood of attaining um, engineering work and their early career salary and what it means for their longer term um, career pathways and um, salary outlook. So I'm gonna ask a question before I give you my two sentences. Most of you are students. How many have found your way to the CCO in Young Hall? Okay, many of you. Not quite half though. Anyway, the Center for Career Opportunities is the campus's comprehensive career center. So we serve all majors at all degree levels and everything from career development, career coaching, um, helping students build job search tools to actually being a hub for employer engagement. And it may be a surprise to some of you, but last year we counted 1,711 unique employers that were physically on campus recruiting students. So we have a very large employer engagement piece to that. All right, thanks. Um, so I'm going to, to go through uh, sort of three questions for the panel. Um, and then we'll turn it over for your questions. And what I'm really asking them to do is that they're, they're each sitting on a large kind of body of knowledge, a wealth of information about this. So I'm gonna ask uh, a question in three parts, basically, which is what is the one thing that you want to tell undergraduates about the transition from undergrad to career that would improve the transition for them? And then I'm going to ask what's the one thing you want employers to know and what's the one thing you want engineering educators to know to assist with the, with the transition? So um, I think we're just going to keep going down the row and have um, each question answered in turn. So what would you tell students about the one thing you think is most important for them to understand about the transition? Um, the, I think that um, when students are in the midst of the curriculum, which especially in engineering is so rigorous, they spend a lot of time in um, deep technical details. Um, they don't always appreciate that there are other marketable skills that um, deserve more priority than many times they get. And so um, I would like to engage students in a discussion about the potential trade-offs of you know, taking this course versus that course. So one that provides depth 
versus one that provides breadth. So this sort of I this idea of a T-shaped engineer that people talk about sometimes. So that's the one thing I would want to in engage in more conversations with students um, about, because there's a lot of value to the top of the T, even though there's a lot of value to the depth as well. Sherry? Um, I, w I think the first thing would be uh, reassuring them that it is a transition and in fact life is a sole series of transitions and, and and I don't know if that's calming you know that they hope that you make a choice and then you're set but in fact um, you're always going to be confronted with the possibility of new roles and um, and stepping into things where you're uncertain um, and and so kind of say get used to that um, I think another thing though I'll, I'll say two things one is um, start the thinking about where you want to be and how you want to be well before, you know, your last semester. Um, because these are really deep and hard questions around uh, what is your world meaning, what is your work meaning, you know, how, how do those uh, reflect where you want to be situated in the next steps, what are your values? And, and these are really hard questions and they're easy to put aside because of the problem sets and all those other things. So, so think about the discipline of being in a community through a career development center with friends um, to, to have yourself actually reflect on those very hard questions. Um, in terms of the one thing that I would like undergraduates to think about as they transition into their careers, I think that um, mentorship, community, and social networks are super important. And um, you know, reaching out to um, other recent graduates who have just gone through the process is really important. Um, seeking out mentors who've been in the workforce for a little longer um, to get their perspective would be really helpful for that process. So really reaching out to their communities for support. And, and I wanna play off that a little bit because a lot of students are genuinely surprised with how many resources there are on this campus. So we really encourage you to take the time to make very well-informed decisions. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, you're on a campus that's aggressively recruited by many kinds of employers. It is easy to just kind of pay attention to the brands and talk to the people who are being particularly savvy and good at talking with you. Um, but there are great resources. One, for instance, is the Career Research Portal which is on the library server, but uh, the CCO and a few other departments pay into that to subscribe to these amazing, robust databases. We also provide a lot of special programming to bring organizations in that don't have those brand names, like the Emerging Employer Career Fair for startups and second stage companies. So it's really to be thoughtful and look beyond the glitz and the branding strategies of the high profile companies to really look and understand what's out there and what the possibilities are. All right, thanks. So what do you want employers to know what could they do to better support early career engineers as they enter their companies? You go. Yeah, I'm just going to keep doing this. Okay. Keep going. <laughs> um, I've been thinking for a long time at all of the universities that I've um, uh, been employed with that there's such an opportunity to work with employers um, to figure out how well calibrated are our graduates to their needs and what are the specific things that we can improve? And so from an employer standpoint, I, I want them to understand that there are willing partners on our side to sort of figure out what does the curricular and co-curricular experience need to look like to add value to everybody's experience, not just on the employer side, but obviously the student um, earning, learning new skills and so forth as well. Um, and so that's, I think that there's, there's not enough of those conversations that happen, you know, kind of routinely, and there's not enough action that comes out of those conversations now, but there are people who are willing on this side to, to do some work to make some of those things improved. Um, I think one thing would be related to um, continuing to reflect and revise what your onboarding strategies are. Um, you know, being aware that uh, when somebody comes into a new environment, 
Um, there are so many acronyms, for instance, as the very you know tr trivial thing, but they can stumble people up. And so, what is that? that process of enculturating and getting someone to really feel like they're a vital member of a team. Um, and, and so uh, reviewing that, and is it working? And is it working for all of your new employees? Um, the second thing, I and this was part of a talk I gave a couple of weeks ago at a conference on women leadership in tech companies. Um, and it was talking about rethink what your strategies are in um, partnering with universities. I mean, I think there are the very valuable traditional recruiting ones, but what can your relationship be with a program in terms of guest speakers and field trips and maybe even co-research? Um, I have a grant with Ford right now that's critically looking at what is the internship experience of product development interns and does it really affect their view of the auto industry in general and their view of themselves, the students, their view of themselves as engineers. So, you know, think more creatively about what is this university industry firm kind of partnership and how can it be actually more productive? Yes, so I would agree with everything that's been said before. Um, I think it's really important to kind of think about the onboarding process as well as the recruitment process, right? So for employers who are interested in diversifying their particular workforce, having an authentic relationship with colleges and universities and really thinking about, you know, these different types of partnerships and how to get students engaged is really important. Amen to everything said. Um, I'll speak a little bit more to the recruiting side because that's, that's what I do. Um, two things in particular. Uh, I already mentioned the numbers to you. Very competitive for employers to meet their talent acquisition needs. There's a lot of competition for them. So we will talk to companies a lot to look at freshmen, talk to them, see potential. Um, one of the worst things I see at the industrial round table or one of the career fairs, when companies l literally wave off freshmen, they don't want to talk to them yet, come back in a couple years, that's a big mistake. And, and really not only speaking with freshmen, but engaging them, helping them be part of that career development, student development process. The other piece is we have some exceptionally wonderful and talented international students. And there are too many companies who can sponsor, who can have these international students come on board through CPT or OPT as interns that don't. And we really confront them on that because there is so much that they bring from a cultural standpoint, from an academic standpoint to the workplace. So really freshmen and international students is really what we have some of those tough conversations with, with employers. Okay, so before we go on to the question about engineering educators, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to change things up and ask a follow-up, which is, what are the points of disconnection for students entering the workforce? So what, how are their expectations uh, not met? And, and I don't necessarily mean that in a negative way, but what surprises them about what they think their first job is going to be like and what their experience typically is? And this one I may ask for volunteers since I'm, I don't want to put each of you on the spot, but anybody that wants to, go ahead, Sherry. Um, so one of the things I've heard from students and employers is um, while it's great in the academy that we're putting students on teams um, and, and really letting them focus for a semester or a quarter for a long period of time on a project, taking it from a need all the way through, um, Students may come in now to the workforce expecting that's what teams are and that people will be co-located and you'll have lots of time together and you'll eat lunch together. And the reality of mis most organizations are being on a team may be you never actually meet your team members and you're on the project for two weeks because you have a particular expertise that they need to draw in. So kind of a mismatch on, on what, what a team means. Um, so, you know, I think that the, the early career engineer needs to figure out, you know, how to be on now what a team is in whatever organization there is to be productive. Um, you know, I think another um, thing that 
that working through is you may be the only 20 something on the group in the group in the work group and so figuring out socially what does it mean to connect with a wider range of people in terms of age and connect as peers because you know the the university kind of has a hierarchy of professors and all of that but but now you're on a group where where you are on a level um, line and so what does that mean socially so I think that's you know two of the things Tim and, and I would certainly speak that it culture because going from a campus culture to a work culture can be very different some of you experience this in your first internship or your first co-op assignment others of you may not experience it till you graduate from college and go into that there are certain things you're used to on campus grades for instance that, that you're essentially going to put a lot of effort into a very specific amount of time, maybe 16 weeks. Um, I know some students will calculate how much effort they put into certain classes to get to a certain GPA threshold, and maybe they don't work quite as hard in some as other. That's different in a work setting. You, you really oftentimes don't have that option. You need to really put forth great effort across the board. Hours. Um, a lot of students, especially as you become upperclassmen, you have a little more control. If you don't want to take those early morning classes, you, you can adjust your calendars accordingly. Sometimes you don't have that kind of flexibility within the work setting. You may have early morning meetings. You, you may need to be involved at hours you're not used to being involved. Social life it can, can be a big thing. I'm sure nobody here has put on a costume and was 4 a.m. down in the... Uh, among the bars for breakfast club. You probably can't pull that off very regularly when, when you're in a work setting. Um, getting plenty of rest, exercise, really being at your best is very important. And even simple things like attire. Um, there is many work settings that you'll be in where it is pretty casual. It, you don't see a lot of coats and ties anymore, de depending on, on the industry and the work setting. But nor are you seeing people come in and cut off jeans and these content uh, flavored t-shirts. So there's adjustments at a lot of different levels. And I think adjusting to that culture from, from the campus to the, to the world of work can be a surprise. Ed. We, we've also talked to a lot of students, uh, interviewed a lot of students who have had internships and co-op assignments. And on the one hand, they often report back a sense of pride that they have been well prepared to do certain elements of their job. So the Purdue students, the Purdue engineers in particular, are not afraid of hard work and that they take that to their, to their job. And they're also technically very well prepared. So they have a skill set that allows them to contribute to whatever the mission is. However, they also have nowhere to hide and they have to, perhaps for the first time, confront things that they maybe aren't so good at. And that is some of the things that you all are mentioning, which is adjusting to a new culture in the organization or doing some sort of remote teaming or their, you know, whatever it might be. And I think that part of the transition, whether it's to a co-op job or to a permanent position, is just managing and knowing that it's not all going to be, you know, entirely smooth and you're going to learn things about yourself. Uh, and it's just been a, a set of interesting discussions with people who come, at, who come back from a co-op assignment and can reflect on that. And it, it helps them sort of think through what are the things I need to, to do to improve so that next time it goes a little bit more smoothly. Joyce, do you have anything to add? Um, yes, so, um, you know, there, there are a lot of students who do experience a mismatch between their own expectations about what work is going to be like and what the reality is once they do start working. But since uh, my research group primarily talks with students who've had co-op experiences and internship experiences, these kind of early work experience actually helps mitigate a lot of some of that, um, you know, Discord, right? So, um, you know, it's a, um, uh, it's a good way to try to kind of, you know, match up the reality between expectations, so to get more consistency. Thanks. All right, so now, and I think this is a nice segue because we've been talking about sort of how do engineering students as they go to co-op, how do, how do they extract lessons from that? How, what do they learn about themselves? So what are the things that engineering educators ought to know about better preparing students for that transition? What are, the, what are the things that can help engineers adapt to their early career pathways? This is, this is a tough question because I think in, in the abstract, 
uh, you can talk to engineering educators and they will say, um, yes, we should do a better job of this or this or this. Um, but then where the rubber meets the road, it's not often their job to do that thing, right? So there's always a, a question of, well, sure, we should do this better, but who's gonna do that? I teach, you know, thermodynamics or I teach transport or whatever I teach. It's not my job to teach teaming or it's not my job to teach, you know, professional skills or communication or whatever it is. So I think there, there is some broad agreement that there, is, there are things that we can do better and it's really difficult um, to have those conversations to figure out how to enact what we think we ought to do. And um, it's, just a, it's just a challenge across the university, not just in this dimension, but there, there's a whole bunch of other conversations we could or should be having that are also uh, challenged by that state of affairs. Um, but there is a way that we can do this, right? There, there are enough people, I think, that um, believe in in moving in, in certain directions that it's possible, but it's really hard. Uh, and that's, that's the challenge we always face. Sherry. Sure. Um, you know, asking what engineering educators can do to, to work in this space is interesting for the, the reasons Ed talked about. And, and for a second reason, many faculty have actually not worked in industry. Um, and, and so, we're talking about a world, we, you know, we're certainly engaged in a real world, the academy is a real world, and um, an organization and all the issues that are in a manufacturing firm, you know, are, are replicated here. Um, but we haven't necessarily looked in, in, been in an environment where, you know, a product is being produced in terms of, of hardware. Um, and, and so, you know, we can provide some of that, but I think, um, again, the relationships with industry as coaches. Um, we have been experimenting at Stanford for um, the last five, maybe 10 years, on, on actually having a course for academic credit called Designing, the, uh, the Designing Your Life, is actually, and there's a book by Dave Evans and Bill Burnett that really gives students time in the course to struggle with these questions. Um, I offer a version of it for PhD students. Believe it or not, PhD students, you know, a year or two years before they finish are stumped by these questions too about, you know, what do I want to do with my life? So, you know, and, and Dave and Bill really have the, um, I'll say the academic chops to really be working in that space of, of questioning, what do you want out of life? Um, so I think making sure there is space in a student's life to ponder and struggle with these incredibly important questions. Um, in terms of, um, you know, what I would say to faculty and instructors, um, you know, be aware of the resources available on campus like CCO. So if um, students ask you um, about, you know, working in industry, um, you can, you know, recommend the, the places that they could go to get more information. Um, second, a lot of faculty already have a lot of, um, you know, opportunities in their own classes for students to develop professional skills. So um, that's already embedded in a lot of the curriculum. So perhaps better signposting that they're there, just calling them out and saying, you know, these skills are going to be important later for when you get into the workforce. I think, you know, kind of flagging it for students will help them think about how they can translate that um, to later. You know, the term mentorship can be a scary term to faculty. And it really is about how it's defined. I know a lot of people, when they think of mentors, they think, okay, I need to commit like eight to 10 hours a week to each student. Obviously, time will pass by quickly. Um, it's more than that definition. Um, in our conversations with students, a simple thing that some students want is just to engage a faculty to learn about their contacts. Who is it that they can connect to maybe as a prospective internship provider or as a prospective hire when they graduate? Who can they connect with as it relates to a particular research? So mentoring, th there can be value to the student in a number of ways beyond a big time commitment for faculty with each of their students, which really just isn't realistic. So being willing to be available, to truly be open and engaged, uh, to have those kinds of conversations with students that help them go a long way. And, and, and we learned that a number of years ago with, with the, the Gallup-Purdue survey in how 
alums even 30 years out really valued having that kind of connection with faculty. Can I say one more thing? Um, so I, I know we're, we're talking undergraduate to workforce, um, but I think those also, also those conversations with faculty can plant seeds about graduate education. And, um, you know, the conversation around what, what, what are you thinking about your future is, it seems like you've really liked these kind of classes, might you think about studying those more in the future? And you know there are some students, maybe because of their background, who've never thought about graduate school as an option either immediately after they graduate, but longer term as, as they really see what um, their needs may be to um, actually get where they want in their career. So that's another thing of, of reminding students they have a range of options um, in their longer career. All right, thanks. So I, it's your time, folks. So this is the risky thing to do on a Friday morning to say, oh yeah, the audience is gonna ask questions, so I'm trusting you all. <laughs> and please use the mic. So um, there are mics traveling and we are recording, so we wanna make sure, first that people can hear you, but also uh, that we're recording your question. <laughs> it's recording the live stream. There you go. Oh, okay. Okay. I'll, I'll, I'll repeat questions Take to your help. Voice. Yep. Okay. <laughs> is also good, very good in engineering and science, and that your students don't have to de declare a major until after their second year, I think. Do you find, or do you feel that that makes a difference in your, your graduates compared to, to graduates from other schools that do not have maybe such richness in terms of breadth? Um, I do think it does, you know, um, in that, um, and, and, and there's no quality judgment. I mean, I think it's, it's a difference. Our students may graduate in mechanical engineering and never have, having taken a controls class. Um, I suspect that MEs here take at least one, at least one controls class. Five or six. So, <laughs> so, so there, there is going to be te more technical chops in that particular thing. 50% of our undergraduates in ME go abroad for a whole quarter, and they're studying in Moscow or Kyoto or Madrid or Berlin or Santiago. So that's a different component of education in terms of, of being in the world. And again, no value judgments, but it does, will represent a different set of views. And, and I think that, um, I think employers are very aware of that and that they need a range of, of engineers with these different points of view to actually have, have a vital, vibrant organization. Um, can, I, can I say two? Sure. I used to work at a liberal arts institution with an engineering school, and now I work at an engineering institution with some other things. We're a comprehensive land-grant university. Am I wrong? Am I wrong? <laughs> Amen. <laughs> and, but my point is that I, I, when I talk to students, um, the kinds of jobs that they get are different. Uh, and the kinds of jobs for which people come to recruit are, are somewhat different too. Uh, and I think it reflects the identity of the institution. And again, it's not a value judgment, it's just a, an access to opportunity is slightly different. So I think it makes, it, it makes a difference. Uh, I'm not sure it's, you know, it's not good or bad, it's just sort of, it's sort of an observation that is. It's, it's two different models of ways that things happen. And, and I would, will also add, about 50% of our ME majors stay on for a master's degree. Um, and they do that, and we have, they call it a co, we call it a co-term um, degree where you get your master's and your bachelor's both at the end of five years. 
um, and in part because they're still hungry for more technical. You know, they feel like there's, they need some more well-roundedness in particular areas of ME. So, so there's also this cost, if you will, to a student who, who wants to go more in depth, feeling like they need that additional fifth year. Tamara. Thank you each for your time. We appreciate that you are here and, and giving, us, giving us the information that you are. Uh, as a first year engineering professor, and my research is really basically on that early side K-12 area, I have, you know, we work really hard to help our students understand the diversity issues around women in the workforce and the, like, it's very important to have multiple perspectives, you know, value the, the international experiences of your, co of your young colleagues with you. And, you know, I think that what I see is in, in the academy here, we, our students are getting a, a diverse and sometimes mixed message about what that's supposed to be. And I heard a story from a, a, young, uh, a young woman who uh, was, has come through our program. She's graduating. She went to interview at a company. This, she told me this yesterday, uh, that when she turned down an offer because the, it was a very hierarchical structure and the, the person who was interviewing her said, be prepared, you're going to have to get dirty, this is not a nice clean job. Like, it was very, it sounded somewhat sexist in the way that, that she, so she, she declined the job. So I feel like there's this, there's a mismatch, and I don't think that's true of all companies, of course, but I think it's still a problem. So what are your thoughts on this issue and how do we continue to make it better and how do we help all levels and not just the early ones start to think about this and, and address that sort of problem. If, if, if I can comment quickly, this is also fresh. Each semester I go into a computer science class and it's part of multi-generations in the workplace. And, and it's a really neat class because each person represents a different generation. I'm the baby boomer, obviously. And we really describe workplaces that are really heavy within those generations. And it's very interesting to engage the students in that, in that Q&A. We actually ask them which they prefer. And it's been fun over the years between the millennials and I guess now the Gen Zs in, in their view of, of these things. But to make a long story short, I think in, what, in some ways that you can integrate that into the classroom really begin to prepare and, and address some of the sensitivity that those areas will be helpful. And you're right, there are some industries that are exactly as the company that you describe, and there are others that are, frankly, far more progressive. So that goes back to the student research about what's a good fit for them. Um, I teach a course called Expanding Engineering Limits, Culture, Diversity, and Equity. and. Um, there's usually about 80 students in it who come to the class for multiple reasons. It, it counts as one of the general education things on engaging uh, diversity. Um, but many of them have also uh, it felt slights or not belonging at certain points during their um, education. And, and even white males, you know, not, uh, not a fit. And so we talk about the social science and reread the social science. And then we talk about the realities of the workplace. Um, and, and that workplaces are also struggling with questions of equity, equity and uh, a distribution of, of types of people and unbiased um, assessment of performance. Um, and, and sometimes the students get discouraged because isn't there a perfect company already that I can step into and it just is all fair. And the reality is there isn't. And they have to be part of actually making the change in the long run. So how can we equip them with strategies and skills and wisdom to, to make some good choices but also say they may have to be activists and figure out what that means in certain organizations. We also talk about them learning to read organizations, you know, reading what the, an organization says on their website about diversity, and then doing information interviewing to talk to people about what is the reality of, of working in a particular situation. So, um, so in, in some ways the academy is more advanced in talking about these issues, but in some ways we aren't, and I think students really need to be aware that um, they're not going to find the perfect fit, but you know, where can they find one that they fi figure out they can flourish and actually have impact? Um. Um, so there was a question in the back corner. Oh, 
it's Carrie. Uh, hi. <laughs> uh, I, I'll stand up so you can see me. But my question is for Sherry, since you're from outside the university. So here, there seems to be a lot of um, emphasis on s sort of speeding up the undergrad degree to get students um, to be working faster. The idea being that the faster they can finish their degree, they can save money. Um, and so I'm kind of curious because what you're talking about is definitely like saying 50% of Emmys are getting a master's, that's definitely not speeding things up. I mean, it's taking longer. And so um, I know some of us have our own feelings about this and as we think about for engineering, but from a, an outside perspective, just kind of curious yeah. if you could uh, kind of talk about that could, balance. Um, you know, and, and there's the tension of if you read the engineer of 2020 report, new skills that are needed too, so we want to actually stuff more into that degree. Um, I would say, um, you know, many of our students actually come in with a full year of AP units, so I also have to say that in terms of their math and science. So they're able to actually start engineering earlier, so they actually may do both degrees in four years. So sometimes it's not extending it out to a fifth year, so that's, that's a little bit of a footnote. You know, I think there's, there's the hurry up, but I think we also have to recognize those years of traditional students, and, and there are non-traditional, you know, of students in their 30s, but that, that age from 18 to 22, and adolescence actually goes into your mid to late 20s, you know, it's, it's not just a, a teenage thing, so is it really great to rush it to get into the workforce and act or actually savor that time to muck around, be uncertain, to you know figure out who you are. So um, I've got conflicted feelings. I know Germany has really struggled um, on this in employment thing for, for uh, a couple of reasons. Their high school used to go up through 13. So students were that older. Um, they had mandatory service, um, and that was either in the military or working on a service organization. And then their first degree was a five-year degree. Um, it was um, the diploma. Um, um, they've gone now to more of our system in terms of their bachelor's is three years. There's no mandatory service anymore, and their high school is 12 years now. And so employers are really struggling that these individuals are now coming in like three to four years younger and really developmentally are at a different place in terms of tackling problems. So I'm not sure we just want to rush it. All right, question in the front. Hello. Um, so my question comes from a place of I've worked in very small companies in different areas, and sometimes, you know, like you said, you're the only 20 person there. What would you suggest on how to meet new people in a new city, or how to really have that work-life balance when you don't have anyone in your company that looks like you? So, suggestions for... Yeah. Yep. Um, I was just having this conversation with, with um, an advisee before I came out here. Um, for her, her faith is a really important part of who she is, and so she's really recognizing finding a church or a synagogue, you know, to, to actually be, be part of that. Um, she's also an athlete, so, you know, figuring out where's, where's the gym that she can, can be joining. Um, and, you know, I've had other students who also recognize, I'm, I'm remembering, actually, it was a young woman, and I won't name the company, but, but everyone there was much older, and they were really into American football. And she really did, she knew nothing about American football. She actually decided she needed to learn something about American football so that, you know, she could open up the conversation. And actually she found that that opened the conversation on a whole set of things once she kind of knew the lingo and the acronyms and all that a little bit with, with football. So sometimes you need to be, um, actually make connections and realize that age doesn't have to be a barrier in terms of, of talking about life and all of its trauma and drama. Social networking, you have a LinkedIn account? So there exists, I don't know if you're already in the group, but there is a Purdue Engineering Alumni Association group, and we partnered with them. So they grew at first with about six to 7,000 alumni, 
and then we occasionally invite students to join. A lot of these alumni are a little older. They, they want to mentor. They want to help make connections. So that is a great way to join and, and just um, do a little bit of a deep dive where you can find those with an affinity. Some might be from your hometown. Some, some may be living where you plan to live and invite conversation that way. So once you connect to one, that's good. The other thing is check the Purdue Alumni Association, see if there's an alumni chapter close by, because that's also a great way to make connections. And, and there are 20 something groups around. I, I'm on Meetup, I'm doing this, I just moved here two years ago, so I'm doing the same thing, looking for community. And I've noticed a lot of things for 20 somethings that I wouldn't go to, right? So. Um, you know, and you, you see those on Facebook, and I and Meetup's a little weird here because there's not quite enough people. So depending on how populated the place is, you can use different tools. Somewhere in the back, there we go. And then yeah, here, and then over there. Okay. Hello. So um, a lot of what's been talked about today is this disconnect in the transition and maybe what uh, undergraduate students and in some cases graduate students lack as they go to uh, a workplace setting. Um, from more of a you know, pros model, what, what are some things that millennials yeah. and gen, what, what is the after millennials? Z. Gen Z, okay. What are things that millennials and Gen Z can are assets and they and they can bring to companies yeah. and how can we also help them realize that this is an asset that they bring because they're living in the world they don't see it necessarily as an asset they just see how it is but what are those strengths that we as educators can help them realize that they bring to companies? We we talk to students all the time. Um, through our research and it was basically what I said before is that they're definitely not afraid of hard work they're passionate about engineering and acquiring skills and acquiring new experiences that test them in terms of their their ability to, to function as an engineer and uh, you know they sort of have that youthful energy that goes with it sometimes and so I think that's all really positive um, it's even more positive if they come with uh, a certain amount of curiosity or, or that kind of openness to new experience. And I don't know if that's exactly characteristic of the whole generation, but if that is part of the package, that's really positive too. Uh, and so I think those are really, uh, those are things that they bring, you know, in, in our case, they bring with them here and we help them sharpen them up. And then they go out and they, they can really deploy those skills uh, in a pretty positive way. I would, um, to that, add um, a, a comfort with technology and um, social media, and you may be going into an organization that's adopting those things, and, and your comfort could be a real asset to a group. You know, I think at the same time, you, you need to maybe recognize playing a role of almost a teacher, because, you know, there may be others who've done things the old way or another way, and it's more comfortable, and so, so how do you play a role in helping others learn to be comfortable with, with something new? And I think playing on that, the, the one thing we know from trending data with millennials and Gen Z is this real passion for wanting to contribute to society, for community service, for making a difference in the world. And I've been fascinated over my years in career services to see how companies sell themselves to prospective hires. And many of the companies are going to talk about that, that they are making some kind of contribution. They may partner with certain charities or certain uh, service organizations. So that is something that as a generation is a really great way to connect. And I'm gonna flag for folks that Professor Pilot, our professor of practice in engineering education has published a book called Millennial Reset, which is all about that question of what millennials bring and sort of how to help industry folks learn what those assets are and how to welcome millennials and make, uh, and make the, the most of what they bring to uh, value add in different settings. And I read the book and it's fantastic. <laughs> um, I'd like to ask you about the current Family Foundation's investment in changing engineering education to include the entrepreneurial mindset. Uh, they've, they've chosen to invest over $30 million in engineering educators. 
but they've chosen schools that value teaching over research for the most part, like Mount Union, Ohio Northern, Valparaiso, Rose Holman. Um, what are the implications of that in terms of what you've been talking about, or in Ed's case, changing faculty? Because they've chosen to invest where they think they can change courses and faculty. Um, and by the way, it's not here. <laughs> Although I had someone from, from a Keene campus basically tell me that I had, to, I had to do it, I had to make Purdue a Keene campus. So I don't know if that's changed, but that's, a, I don't, are, you, is, are you involved with them, Sherry? So um, I don't know that anybody here has uh, a lot of expertise, but I will say I think they're broadening their campuses um, to, for, for this. So they did start, and in fact, I was on a small teaching campus that couldn't get into Keene because we proposed a social entrepreneurship project when they, at that time, they weren't doing that, now they are. So there's an interesting kind of shift in how they're building their change movement. So um, some of our faculty do have some research partnerships in, in this space with them. So even though we're not um, officially a campus, we are working with them and bringing some of the things that are being learned to our campus as well. So there are our partnerships. But I, I think to your point, it's a very, it's a much longer conversation than we have time for here <laughs> about the, um, the way that individual people uh, prioritize how they spend their time and what they choose to invest in and what they choose to not invest in. And I, in this case, I'm talking about faculty um, because a lot of these changes uh, just can't happen without faculty direct, very um, sort of close and diligent and in some cases very long-term involvement. Um, and you're right, not every campus uh, has a culture in which that can happen very easily. Um, so I, I mean, I don't know what the answer is, but there's a very long set of uh, what would you say, sort of incentives and rewards and constraints and so forth that make that possible in certain places and not as possible in other places. So I agree that it's a, it's a big perennial problem, uh, challenge to sort of figure out what we can do um, within, within our environment. All right, we have seven more minutes. More questions? Here's one in the front. Thank you all for being here today. Uh, so, some of you have actually brought up some of, some of these relevant points about the T-shaped curriculum. Carrie asked about the more and for. I want to ask, I feel, I feel like there's this, this panel today is about lining up uh, students and uh, moving into work, workforce. But education should be more than just preparing students for workforce. What would you tell legislators who are, so we're at a public university, there's a decrease uh, in public funding for public education, including in higher education. What would you tell legislators about the broader need for, um, for a broader education than just preparing engineering students for workforce? Thank you. give you a minute to think about it. It looks like Joyce might have something. Um, so with Audine Fentiman, Carl Smith, as well as Karen Watson, we we're thinking about proposing a reinvigoration of the Morrill Act to try to bring in more funds to public research universities to focus on engineering, the mechanical arts, as well as liberal arts, so all together. So. Yeah, and that's an important thing people don't realize about the Morrill Act. The, the phrase, you know, uh, agriculture and mechanical arts gets quoted a lot, but the rest of that sentence has liberal arts in it. So it was always meant to be comprehensive education for everybody, right? That was, that was the vision, so. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I think this is a message not only to legislatures, but the public in general is, um, our education is too expensive in the United States. I mean, the, um, the, the debt that you know, students take on for this thing that they hope will make their life better or give them more opportunities is just um, 
unreasonable. I mean, when you look at other, other systems, um, in Germany there was student uprisings when they actually were going to charge like 300 euros a semester um, for their education. And so the public commitment to saying this is a public good as opposed to a personal thing, um, it needs to be part of the shift back Anyone else? Over here? Yeah. So you were talking about how freshmen international students are the ones who struggle the most to obtain the company's attention uh, because of their lack of experience, I may say. So me, as an international student and as a freshman student, <laughs> how could we approach, like, better approach these companies in order for them to notice us since, since we just want to learn about their companies so we can decide what to do with our future? Very good question. Um, I think one piece of advice that I will give quickly to freshmen, because sometimes they'll go to places like the Industrial Roundtable and they encounter one or two companies who are just not open to having a conversation they give up too easily. In reality, a lot of companies want to have those conversations. In addition to the career fair formats, they're here for information sessions. Um, in some cases, they may be in the classrooms. They, they may be here even in more informal ways. So I think having the confidence uh, to persevere and, and get in, in front of the companies and, and approach them in a way as, I, I know I'm a freshman and your internships might be geared for someone more experienced, but I really am interested in your company, as a matter of fact, and that's where you go to the career research portal and you learn what you can about these organizations. So essentially, you, you get them interested in knowing that you're a prospective hire at some point in the future. And if you go to that portal and you look at some of those databases and you learn more about the company, it will just give you confidence that you can have the kind of conversation that's going to make you much more attractive to them as a candidate. And a lot of the same recruiters come year after year. So you could meet somebody in your first year and then see them again when you're a sophomore and again when you're a junior and, and you're building a relationship. And so to think about the long game as well, even if they're not hiring first years, they might, you know, you can come back. <laughs> And something to know as an international student, companies might have this <coughs> across the board, we don't talk to international students, but I can tell you for a fact, developing those kinds of relationships, they may not want to advertise it because they're afraid that it will be a cast of thousands that want to talk to them. But establish those relationships and you may be surprised that they'll figure out a way to try to work you in and provide you with that internship experience. So, don't take we don't hire internship always as a kind of a black and white carved in cement issue. Can I inject to that? Just I'm connecting Alice's point to this point is that it's, it seems like it's very easy to play the short game in a lot of respects. So legislatures might have a relatively near term view or students or employers might have a near term view. But I think this idea of playing the long game because I mean, for better or worse, you're not going to be able to retire for like 50 years. <laughs> right? so, so, you, so it is a very long game, and that's really important advice. That's, that's really, it, it just, the, the connection there was sort of interesting. All right, we have one minute. So any final thoughts from the panel? Have a really good summer. I'm envious. <laughs> The CCO does not shut down for the summer, so for students who are here that want to come utilize our services, we have drop-in hours in the afternoon. During the fall and early spring, our drop-in hours are 10 to 4, Monday through Friday, so take advantage of the resources. Plus, there's a lot fewer students in our offices in the summer. You get a lot of attention. All right, will you join me in thanking our panel? Thank you.